Hello, my friends and listeners. I am here today with the wonderful Candace James, who happens to be one of my most treasured mentors and coaches. And she has agreed to come on the show, which delighted me absolutely, because I know you're going to find her to be fascinating and funny and so smart. And we're going to talk about many, many things. I'm sure of this. Uh, I'm also sure that we're going to eventually land on the topic of sales because that is Candace's area of expertise. She's a sales advisor and trainer, but she's also got so many different life experiences that she uses with her beautiful work. And I can't wait for you to meet her. Welcome Candace to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's get started and dig deep because I know you go deep (laughs) right away and just (laughs) let us know more about you and some pieces of your background and wonderful history. Whatever you don't mind sharing here, we'd love to hear. Yeah. Um, I love these questions because it's also, I find something that's so interesting is like when you are asked to like describe yourself or your journey, right? There's like things that just stick out. And then you're like, man, do I talk about this too much? Or like, (laughs) you know, that's that sort of judgment in self sometimes comes up. But for me, really, I guess like I have just had um, growing up, I was like this type of person who was like, what can I try? And what can I see what it feels like and what can I experience and what can I, and that got me into trouble sometimes, not going to lie. And sometimes it it brought me into like really beautiful avenues. Um, But I would say for like the last 23 years, I have been in some type of sales position, Um, whether it was more internal sales and marketing or it was external sales, like to the client. I have been working in that for like over 23 years, which most people are like, wait, how old are you? Um, (laughs) Because you've been doing that for how long? But it was literally, I started when I was like 15 years old, like just Mm -hmm. working in sales and marketing. Um, I've lived in, you know, uh, Thailand for five and a half years. I lived in Italy for a couple years. Um, I trained in the mountains of Thailand doing like mindfulness meditation. Um, Went to the University of Toronto to learn how to apply mindfulness meditation to regular life instead of just sitting on a mat somewhere in the mountains, which is great. But how do we bring that into our modern life? Um, Wrote a book, did some business things. I've had my own business since I was like 10 when I first started um, teaching piano lessons. So from 10 until 40, I've had a million different businesses, cooking, cooking. Uh, image consulting, everything, you name it, been there, sold that, did that. And now here I am on your beautiful podcast. Um, <laughs> and my focus is really helping people to to feel confident and easeful in, in selling their programs um, so that they can have the life that they really truly desire. That's beautiful. I had heard much of your story, but not the mountaintop part. And probably not the 10-year-old part. Can you take us back to when you were 10? Let's go there and just let us know how you knew that you wanted to do a business. You wanted to kind of take yourself out of just you know your, your own individual circle and start to connect with other people in that way. Yeah, I think it was like mainly for me, I was 10 and I was very, even just from like a very young age, like you'd get, like I'd get like an allowance. And I think my allowance, you know, to do chores around the house, I think I got like $2 a week or something like that. And so I would save all that money. I would hoard that money because I wanted to buy something amazing. Like I always had these big dreams for like what I could have, what I could achieve. And so I would always hoard all this money. So as I got older, I, I took piano lessons since I was four years old. And so when I was 10, I was good enough that I could at least teach like new four-year-olds, right? Like people who were just learning. And so I started a business and I, my mom took me around. She was always so supportive, still is. She's my number one fan. And uh, she helped me like put up... Um, flyers around the neighborhood and people would come over to our house and I would teach them piano lessons. And for me, it was less about like, I didn't really, I don't really think I had the concept of like, oh, I'm kind of like going to start a business or I'm going to whatever. It was just like, I need things. I want things. How do I get them myself? I don't want to rely on other people. I've always been like a fiercely 
independent, somewhat defiant human being. And it's just like, how can I do this? I don't want to rely on just my, my, um, allowance that I was getting every week. I wanted bigger things. I wanted more things. And so for me, it was just like, how can I go out there and figure that out myself? So I started teaching piano. Wonderful. So it was just a natural, a natural urge, a natural uh, drive for you, which is terrific. I also know from hearing you on stage a couple of months ago that your family is has been involved in business entrepreneurship. Is that correct? Am, am I correct? Am I remembering um, it that yeah, way? Yeah, my father has been in sales. So I just turned 40 like last month and my father was in used car sales for 41 years. So I grew up around him. Like it was a commission only, like, yes, he worked for a dealership, but it was a commission only business. And it was like, you got to go out there and you got to get it. And uh, I used to just value my time with him so much. He worked long hours, which is the one thing that I have flipped. (laughs) I love sales. (laughs) I love running a business. I love doing these things, but I'm not willing to work 65 hours a week and leave out my family, right? So not to say he left us out, but it was like there was just a lot of long hours. And he did it all for us. But, um, you know, looking back, I think we all wished we had a little bit more time. So I think I learned two things from him, how to be an epic salesperson and two, um, how to kind of weave in a bit of a more of a work-life balance. Okay, beautiful. Uh, on this show, I, I'm always inclined to ask people how they've overcome some sort of struggle within themselves, perhaps, to find the freedom and the success and the happiness that they have currently. Could you take us through one or two stories that you might have about just obstacles of your 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 own mindset getting in your way or life maybe getting in your way too? Yeah. Um, it's interesting when you say that because like I've gone through a lot of uh, really intense things <laughs> in my life and I think that that makes me a much stronger person and able to overcome a lot more, uh, makes me strive for more. I think also like my first near death experience, I was three years old and I actually remember leaving my body and being able to like look down on myself, which is weird. People are like, you were three. How do you remember? I'm like, I don't know. I don't think you forget something like that. Like it's, it's just something that, that sticks with you. Um, And then as I got older, you know, there was just like a lot of stuff in life of um, like from eight to 18, just being heavily bullied by people in school and being told I wasn't good enough and being told I was weird and being told that my voice was awful. Like there was not one thing that people (laughs) wouldn't pick on. And, uh, And my mother was just so beautiful. She helped me just be like, I don't care. Um, she would always like, if I got made fun of for the shirt I was wearing, she'd encourage me to wear it again tomorrow. Like do it again. Let's wear it again. Let's do it. Like, don't let these people dictate who you are. And I think going through that experience really made me just like, um, a lot more, like, obviously it was a terrible experience. I don't wish it upon anybody, but at the same time coming out of it, I think it just made me so much more able to think outside the box. And, um, you know, to say, okay, you know what, I am definitely different because people comment on it every single day. So how do I just use that to my advantage instead of making that a weakness, right? So you have to start to shift like how you see yourself in that. So I think at a very early age, I was kind of forced to look at different ways to view myself and um, without getting caught in that you know, really downward spiral of like, I don't fit in and people don't like me and blah, blah, blah. It was like, cool. They don't like me, but why, why am I different? What, what's exciting? Like, I just tried to find different ways in which, um, I could be valuable and not based on like the status quo, you know what I mean? Um, and then, you know, later on I was going through a lot of stuff. My family and I are very close. That was kind of on rocky ground. And so I just moved to Thailand. (laughs) <laughs> as one does. He just moved to Thailand and um <laughs> and I stayed there for five and a half years. Um and then I had like there I had a near death experience and then I had PTSD and then like you know there's just like a lot of stuff that I think 
you overcome in life. But sometimes I think the biggest lesson that I've learned out of all of it is that you're the only person that knows you. And sometimes what you need to do to better your life, whether it's your business, whether it's your personal life, whether whatever it is, like you are the only person that truly knows you on the inside and stop trying to conform to what other people think you should do. And I think it's just really important that you learn to listen and learn to understand your true self and what your true self needs. And maybe the decisions you make, I know I've had this feedback from people, the decisions I've made in my life, like I'm going to move to Thailand, then I'm going to move to Italy, then I'm going to do this. People are like, what are you doing? And I'm like, feeding my soul. You know, my soul needs something and I'm going to go feed it and I'm going to learn what I need to learn. And then when I came back, I was capable of so much more because I was the truest version of myself that I had ever been. Wow. I'm so glad you have said the the past few sentences because I knew we were going to get there somehow <laughs> about the importance of knowing yourself and the the conflict that can be everywhere all the time, even with your closest loved ones about what to do, who to be, what's possible for you and what's right for you. And uh, I I definitely see you as someone who is firmly grounded in herself and has been through the journey. You know, on, on social media, I think it was yesterday, I saw a post with two balls rolling downward on this thing. And one was going in a straight line and the other ball was on an up and down path. And it showed actually that the up and down ball traveled faster and farther than the ball that went straight down the hill, which you wouldn't think. I didn't actually think that, um, but it's a beautiful thing to see. And when we do have maybe near death experiences and um, areas where people don't understand us and they really don't get us and they put pressure on us, we actually are forced to grow. Those triggers are the areas where we have to look at ourselves in a deeper way. And you're right. You're absolutely right. We're the we're the ones who know us. It's just our work in the world, I guess. Um, so thank you for getting us there. I wanted to say um, a bunch of things. You're making me think of a bunch of things. <laughs> But the the near death experiences, I'm sure my followers are curious about what might have happened, and also how even going through things like that have shaped you. Oh, for sure, yeah. the The first one, I was three years old, and I was camping with my family. Uh, my cousins were there; everybody was there, and I started just breathing really funny. And um, my parents, I used to have croup a lot when I was a kid, like. And uh, so my mom started treating me for croup, thinking that that must be what was going on. And uh, and it, it just wasn't getting better. And so she's like, okay, no, we got to leave this campground. So she took me to the hospital and they got to the hospital and they're like, no, it's definitely croup. And then it wasn't, clearly it was getting worse. So they had to send me to an emergency children's hospital, make master's children, saved my life twice. Mm -hmm. But anyways, so we went there and, um, they were like, oh my gosh, it's called epiglottitis. And it's like this rare viral virus that just came from nowhere, very contagious. So they, my, my whole family had to take all this medicine and everything to make sure they didn't get it because they came out and they told my parents, you have, your child has a 90 it was 97 or 98% death rate for this disease. And so basically your child has a 3% chance of living. And I was three. And obviously it sent my parents into a whole whirlwind. But I remember in that moment, like seeing, I don't remember going there. I remember a brief moment in the ambulance. And then I remember like, it was like an out of body experience, which was really crazy. Where I was looking down and I could see the doctors trying to fix me. And they had a very limited amount of time. So it was like this whole rushed thing. And I just see myself laying there, which is wild. And then all of a sudden I was back in my body and out. Like then I remember everything from the first perspective, like seeing my family come and visit me. Right. But, um, 
I remember like as I got older, I was like, wow, that was like a really crazy experience. (laughs) And being able to see that, I just always felt like I had something to give to the world and that I wasn't supposed to go yet. Like there was some divine intervention there in like, you're not supposed to go, you have something. And also it was a reminder of like, life is short. Um, And then I had a lot of family members pass away in the next 10, 15 years, like people very close to me. And then um, it wasn't until gosh, like a few years ago now, after 2020, I think it was around 2021, 2022, I was sitting at home watching this episode on Gaia. I don't know if you see, if you dive yep. Gaia.com, love that thing. Yep. Anyways, I was watching <laughs> something about like the heart and its thing with the universe. And I don't know what they said. I honestly have no idea. All of a sudden it was like, I was right back to that out of body experience. And I don't think I'd ever fully felt it before. And it was like the sense of calm, of peace, of knowing, of just like everything is okay. And I was like, whoa, because, sorry, I skipped a part. I had PTSD after a second near-death experience like for five years prior to that. And so all of a sudden that PTSD went away. Um, And then I had another, I almost died last year as well. Um, But You know, I think the main thing that came from it is that death feels scary. It does. A lot of people are very scared of death, especially as you age or if you have ailments. Like, I totally get that because trust me, I've been there. (laughs) And now I've been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, which is hard to handle. Um, But what it really taught me is that, like, we're only guaranteed this one life on Earth whether you believe in reincarnation, whether you believe in anything else, I don't, you know, the only thing that we're guaranteed is this moment, this present moment, and maybe one after, but we're not even guaranteed that, right? Anything could happen at any time. And I've seen that three times in my life so far, that Mm -hmm. at any moment, it could all just be over. And it really just drives me to be the best person that I can be, to not live my life based on what I think other people think I should do, not based on who other people think I should be. And like, just to be the best human. Like I live my life with compassion and kindness every single day. I want to make the world a better place. I want to help people live a better life. I want to help them build their business. I want to help them succeed. I want to do all of this. And at the same time, like just do like crazy stuff. I was going to swear, and I don't know if I'm allowed on this podcast. So I was just like, ah, but like do crazy stuff on the weekends, you know, like go do that fun thing, go rent that place and lay by the water and like do all that stuff. Like just do what you can while you're here and stop worrying so much about like how things are supposed to be. Like so many people live their lives trapped in what their parents or society or someone told you that you should be. And, um, we got to let that go, you know, because you're going to sit here for your 8,505 years on earth and you're not going to be who you truly are. And so that to me is just sad to think that how many people get stuck in that. And yeah, I had to almost die three times to get through that <laughs> and be bullied <laughs> and be whatever. But you know what? Like you said, like I, I loved that thing where you said like the, the hills, like I can see like, right, the ball all of a sudden it speeds up and it goes flying over the hill and it does whatever. Like, you know, it's, um, I think it's really cool to kind of look at it that way. And it's really important to just like, just be you. I know it sounds really ridiculous and simple and cliched, but honestly, it's the truth, you know? Yes, I agree. I keep thinking about the word conformity, which you have used. Um, and for our listeners who might be struggling in this area of really wanting to kind of act as themselves, be authentic, do the bold thing, break free of stereotypes and conformity and restrictions, but they're still right right at that line. I guess, how would you, what would you say to them? It's like, it sounds a bit dire, but at the same time, like, if you think about that tomorrow you're going to die, tomorrow you go to the hospital, just like I did, go to the hospital and you're laying in that bed and and you're about to die and you may or may not be saved. What's flashing through? It's 99% of what you didn't do. 
right? It's, I didn't do this and I didn't allow myself to act in this way. And I wasn't able to be myself and show what I wanted and do all of these things. Like, you know, it's when I almost died the second time I was on like a boat, which almost capsized in the Thai um, sea and, and we didn't have any life jackets and it was a crazy storm and my body went into shock. It was, it was quite a, a situation, but Later, I started thinking and was like, man, I have done so much, more than most people. I was like 29 years old. And I was like, I have done more in my 29 years than a lot of people have done at 50, 60, 70 years. And so I had to just get okay with, you know what, if I go, then I go. But there were still things that were nagging me that like, I got to do them, you know? And it's just like, I just feel like you're so scared of... Um, and I get it, right? Like the ego is telling you to be safe. The ego's job is to keep you alive. The ego's job is to keep you within, you know, your community, to be liked, to be valued, right? There's, um, there was a book I read and I don't remember what it's called at the moment. I can tell you later if you want, but it was like about tribes, right? How humans are tribal creatures. And so the need, so back in the day when we only had our tribe and we were hunters and gatherers, we needed the whole tribe to survive right? So basically we would have to conform in order to not be kicked out of the tribe because if we were kicked out of the tribe, we're just one person. Now we're probably not going to survive on our own, right? We have to. These days you can buy your own apartment. You can go to the grocery store. <laughs> you can do all those things. You can survive, but our, our brain is still formulated that way. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of look at it like, if I am myself, what if I get kicked out of my tribe? And this is a subconscious thought. What if I get kicked out of my tribe and now I'm on my own? And so what if you're on your own? Because that's oftentimes when you're going to find the most beauty in life because you don't feel like you need to, uh, you don't feel the fear of judgment. You don't feel whatever. And I'm also going to tell you that when you are yourself, that's usually when people love you the most. And you can still keep your tribe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And you right. can also, like, you don't have to bring your entire weirdness into your tribe all the time. You can go be weird on the side. <laughs> <laughs> and also from social media the other day, when you are behaving as your true self or your mm -hmm. highest self or your most potent self, the people that you're really meant to be with will find you as well. So people so, who yeah. haven't been able to see you will now be able to see you. Um, and so thank you, Candice, for for being yeah. our teacher today and for me in the past years as well. Let's talk about how this might relate to your area of expertise now that you've really doubled down on the area of doing sales. I've heard you speak so beautifully about the process of sales, which can be very frightening and daunting, daunting, mm -hmm. and even icky to people, um, it can bring up a lot of different feelings about appropriateness and mm -hmm. who am I to be doing this, and who really cares about what I'm trying to do in this world. It, it's it's really quite loaded. I think for me in the past as well, probably still in the in the current day as we speak. So I would love to hear your framework and, and how you've integrated 